Missing hope the authorities are closer to discovering what happened to the missing Malaysia Airlines plane. Jenica Geraghty has more. The flight from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing vanished two weeks ago with more than 200 people on board, including six Australians. Prime Minister Tony Abbott has cited significant developments in the past 24 hours, including new Chinese satellite images of an object consistent with previous satellite imagery and several small items spotted by a civilian plane in the Australian search zone. Mr Abbott says until some of the material is recovered, he can't say for certain it's related to the Malaysia Airlines flight. Obviously, we have now had a number of very credible leads. HMAS success is in the search area, and today's efforts will be boosted by two Chinese aircraft and two Japanese Orions. OK, YouTube. So let's have another update on this missing Malaysian Airlines Boeing 777, which I don't have a model of, therefore we're illustrating it with a model of a Boeing 747. Just pretend that it hasn't got the lump on the front, and imagine that there's only one engine under each wing, and you've got something similar to the shape in question. Okay, so it's over a fortnight. I did have a pretty interesting theory regarding micrometeorite strike on the top edge of the co-pilot's cockpit window, filling the cockpit with, well, shrapnel, killing the crew, damaging the autopilot, switching off the radios and causing the aircraft to turn 90 degrees left and then fly purely on its designed stability, its aerodynamic tendency to return to level flight once it's been trimmed at a particular weight with a particular throttle setting. And uh, that would account in my mind for its observed behaviour as in turning 90 degrees off course, diving from 35,000 feet to about 5,000 feet, maybe it was 8,000 feet, then climbing up to 45,000 feet, then diving across the Malay Peninsula down to you know, 2,500 feet over the land and then disappearing off the military radar going westwards generally out across the Andaman Sea. Um, yeah, if the aeroplane was just throttled, stuck, engine management computer dealing with the fuel flow and the switchover and the crossover from the tanks, then it might in fact go quite a long way like that. And Every time a bit of rising air was going faster under the right wing than the rising air coming up under the left wing, the aeroplane would turn to the left. Sailplanes do it all the time. If you get a sailplane and you don't fly it into the rising air, the sailplane will turn away from the thermals. It's just a function of aerodynamics. And every time the dihedral levelled the wings, the surface area of the tail behind the centre of pressure of the wings would ensure that the aeroplane attempted to hold that course. But in level flight, thrust equals drag and lift equals weight. And in that unguided case, that unguided situation with the throttles left, wherever they were at the point of diversion, as the fuel burns, the weight reduces and therefore the aeroplane climbs. And when it gets up around 45,000 feet, there's not enough oxygen for the engines to make enough thrust, there's not enough air pressure for the wings to make enough lift, and eventually it will stall, and then maybe recover, pointed somewhere else in the fullness of the time. So <clears throat> I get to town on Friday afternoon and my daughter, who's not particularly interested in aeroplanes, had also been paying attention to the case and she read to me a Facebook blog from a retired airline captain who pretty much agreed with me as to the aerodynamic tendency of the aeroplane to fly itself off in a generally westward direction into the Indian Ocean as modified by the vagaries of turbulence. However, instead of positing a micrometeorite strike on the cockpit, this retired airline captain suggested that a much, well, his most likely scenario was that taking off on a hot night from a tropical runway, 
The nose wheel overheated the wheel bearing due to the length of the takeoff roll, perhaps somebody holding the stick slightly forward, so increasing the pressure on the bearing. But an overheated nose wheel bearing has then been folded up into the nose wheel well and the undercarriage doors have closed over it. But there's always a few chinks of high speed airstream coming into an undercarriage compartment. And he posited that the overheated axle grease had smouldered and taken its time becoming an actual fire which had raised the temperature of the cast alloy wheel hub and the rubber of the tyre whereupon about an hour after takeoff the rubber of the tyre has caught fire. And when you consider the position of the nose wheel well underneath and in front of the floor of the cockpit you wind up with a fire in the nose wheel well resulting in high pressure toxic rubber smoke flooding the cockpit. This bloke cited as an example a famous nose wheel well fire from a burning tyre on a Douglas DC-8 taking off out of Florida back in the 50s or 60s written up by a famous airline pilot writer called Ernst K. Garn, and I think it was in the book called The High and the Mighty, but I could be wrong, it could be in one of the other ones. He wrote a few really good books, cherished by aviation types. But the point was that yeah, after taking off and climbing out away from Florida over the Atlantic Ocean, these people had a nose wheel catch fire and fill the cockpit with toxic smoke, and they barely made it back to land in a runway by basically opening the window and sticking their head out. Uh, <coughs> this fellow suggests that as soon as the smoke started coming out of the instrument panel, the pilots have gone either onto their oxygens or their air hoods. Uh, oxygen's not a good idea when there's a fire. They've then pulled the bus bars and isolated absolutely everything electrical except for the controls, the aerodynamic controls and the engine controls and they've left those alone but they've they've just pulled the circuits basically de defused every other electrical circuit on the airplane in case the smoke and the fire was coming from an electrical fire inside the instrument panel and to prevent the heat from any nose wheel fire if they figured out that was what was happening to prevent that from igniting an electrical fire if it got onto some wiring and melted the insulation off it. So that's why the transponder went down, that's why the VHF went down, that's why the ACARS went down. It also explains why, in this bloke's opinion, they've punched in a course to the navigation computer, put in six or seven latitude longitude coordinates and then hit the enter button and it's turned the aircraft in the precise track from where they were over the top of an island which this retired airline pilot says he googled and discovered that the island um, I think it was on the near side of the Malaysian Peninsula to where the diversion point but he says it's got a 13,000 foot dirt runway and it was the nearest possible point to stick your burning passenger airliner on the ground if the nose wheel catches fire and lets you know by filling the cockpit with toxic smoke one hour after takeoff. He suggests that the extreme steep descent was an attempt to put into practice all those World War II night bombing stories of Lancaster and Halifax and Stirling pilots who tried to dive in order to increase the airspeed, in order to blow the fire out when they had a burning engine on their bomber over Germany in the 1940s. So he figures that's why the extreme steep descent, that's why the track towards the island with the 13,000 foot runway, and he reckons that either the crew were completely overcome by the heat and the smoke, and the aircraft's natural aerodynamics pulled it out of the dive and that's why it climbed up to 45,000 feet and then wallowed and then fell off on one wing and disappeared stalling and diving and porpoising. Or the cockpit crew decided that diving at the ocean was not succeeding in putting the fire out because there was denser air with more oxygen in it the lower they went and therefore they've pulled the nose up and gone up to absolute maximum altitude ceiling in an attempt to starve the fire of its oxygen, which it would be one last desperate grasping for straws, and I think an incorrect one, 
because by going straight up like that they're ignoring the fact that the engines have got enough oxygen to burn and if the engines will burn then the force draft on the hydraulic fluid in the nose wheel will continue to burn. Um, I guess, speaking as an absolute 2020 hindsight devil's advocate, if that was the situation and they were coming down through 8,000 feet and they had an insufferable fire in the nose wheel, the only thing to really do would be um, cut the power and dive at the ocean and try and flare with your last dying breath and pancake the passenger cabin onto the ocean and hope that there were people back there who could um, evacuate the cabin and swim around while waiting for a rescue launch. Going back up was a bad idea and it probably was not a voluntary idea. In my opinion, if this bloke's right, if they had a nose wheel fire, then switching off the radios, turning in the direction of a runway, diving steeply at the waves, that was their attempt at getting back down and the climb back to altitude and the wallowing off into the southern, southern Indian Ocean. That's what happened after everybody was overcome. As for the story of uh, the search in the southern Indian Ocean, let's have a look at the maps. Okay, so once again we've set the dividers on one hour's flight time. So what we've got there is eight hours to Beijing, nine, ten hours, eleven, twelve hours. Now <clears throat> that's your absolute maximum range assuming that the aircraft stayed the whole time at the most efficient cruise height and the most efficient throttle setting. I don't see it in an unguided condition going for 12 hours. I think it's unlikely it would even go as, as long as 10 hours because 8 hours was how long it was planning on going. 10 hours is for diversions, the other 2 hours is absolute emergency, but that assumes being up at 35,000 feet. And we have two radar accounts from Thailand as well as Malaysia saying that this thing came down to 8,000 feet and uh, 2,500 feet. And when you're down at low altitude, the air's thicker, therefore there's more oxygen, thus and because it burns more fuel. So what we've got here is uh, five hours, eight hours, ten hours, and twelve hours, right? Now, <clears throat> one of the strange things is that I keep hearing from the Australians that they're searching two and a half thousand miles which is that circumference arc there southwest of Perth right so if I'm to believe my own government they're searching down there whereas this line here represents pretty much the ultimate extended dry tank engine management computer pumping the very last of the fuel up to the engines in an unguided, wobbling, waving, porpoising track that's being dictated by the vagaries of aerodynamics and the stable dynamic instabilities designed into the airframe. And that would give us an impact area two thirds of the way between Broome and Madagascar. And the other interesting feature about this pair of dividers is set on 350 miles, that's about a week each divider point distance, a week worth of drift because it's drifting at, uh, or actually no it's not, not really a week because it's drifting at 1.7 knots. That's a week worth of drift at one knot. So let's say Impact point there, one, two, three. So you would expect the debris to have drifted somewhere along there with the drift that away at 1.7 knots because it's been drifting for two weeks at 1.7 knots. If what they've sighted is what they're looking for. And here's the other caveat. 
right? They say it's a piece of debris 24 feet long with lots of smaller bits of debris, but when they went and had a look at the smaller bits of debris, there was a packing crate and there was a whole lot of seaweed. 24 metres is the exact same dimension that the Chinese satellite claimed to have found in the South China Sea off the coast of Vietnam over a week ago. 24 metres, allegedly seen off here, 24 metres long, allegedly seen down here, yet we've heard Admiral Chris Barry, bloke who was in charge of the Royal Australian Navy when they found a British yachtsman called Chris Barrymore or somebody like that, fella in a yacht down here, what this Chris Barry said was 24 metres sounds an awful lot like a 20 metre by 3 metre by 3 metre shipping container washed off the deck of a merchant boat in a strong storm when it wasn't chained down strongly enough, floating just barely a wash. So it's entirely possible that when they get there, they may not find anything anyway. But, I reiterate, I've, uh, I've swallowed my micrometeorite story and I've gone with the idea that an engine, uh, sorry, a nose wheel fire has caused the crew to divert to the nearest known runway and they've lost consciousness and lost control of the aircraft afterwards and it's been wavering around until finally it ran out of fuel and it's somewhere at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. And if you don't mind my saying so, I'm fairly cranky with the aviation security industry for using this episode as an excuse to push their barrow about how it's obviously been hijacked and therefore we need to have increased scrutiny on passengers and crew and maintenance personnel at all airports because at the moment there hasn't been a whole lot of problem with hijacking for a long time and airlines are having great trouble staying afloat because with the global financial situation and the implosion of the industrialized economies not many people can afford to save up and go on a clap catching holiday somewhere in some other country and therefore there's not as many people wanting to take airline flights and nobody can afford to pay the security guards to stand there and wave their metal detector wands around and go snooping on people's background on the web. So this tragic incident where the aircraft has apparently crashed due to a fire in the nose wheel undercarriage well is being exploited by the insecurity industry that hopes to be cut a slice of the action on every airline ticket that everybody buys in the future. And I think what they stand to do is, uh, if they're successful in causing more airport security, they will raise the price of airline tickets and cut the number of airline passengers and send all the airlines broke faster. And, well, in light of global warming and carbon dioxide emissions, that can't be a bad thing, can it? So there seems to be a method in the madness and there's, uh, there's a reason behind the plan somehow from some point of view if you stand well back and maybe if you squint. Orbles on a lot to YouTube. You got any better ideas on what's going on with the missing Malaysian Aero Celeste? Because that's the best I can come up with. Not a micrometeorite. Nose wheel fire. Not hijacking. Just an unusual chain of events. And I guess I have a storm coming in. So I'd better call a halt to this movie and check it and see if it's worth uploading. Warbles on a lot of YouTube. Ciao.